For newcomers to the Adlai Stevenson Center on Democracy, I am Nancy Stevenson, President. I'm here to welcome you to this program with Newt and Martha Minow on the importance of accessible, believable news for maintaining and strengthening our democracy. The Stevensons have had the wonderful good fortune of enjoying the benefits of good counseling, wise conversation, delightful stories for three generations of friendship with the Minow family. It started with Adley too, who took on a young, brilliant law counselor and then partner named Newton Minow. He and his lively, lovely wife, Jo, threw themselves into two campaigns for president for Adley in 1952 and 1956. Newt, as he tells you in his introduction to Martha's book, has been steeped in all sides of the news world for seven decades starting in World War II, when a young, young soldier helped lay the wires for communication on the Burma, now Myanmar road. President Kennedy named him chair of the Federal Communications Commission in 1961, where Newt delivered his blockbusting critique of television as a vast wasteland. On the FCC, he initiated the Fairness Doctrine and plus working to enlarge access to communication. He has also worked in book publishing through the Encyclopedia Britannica, television news channels like CBS, radio and newspapers, the Chicago Tribune and Sun-Times to name a few venues. As he has said, he has seen all sides of the elephant, including its backside. His passion all along has been public service the development and courage, promote, encouragement, promotion of public broadcasting for the youngest with Sesame Street and PBS in general for us elders. Throughout these active years, he not only shared his passions with the public, but at the dinner table and in daily conversation with his family. We first knew Martha, one of Newton Joe's three splendid active daughters when she was a bright, curious, and charming visitor at the Libertyville home of Adley II. She grew up to become a professor at Harvard Law School in 1981 and dean of the law school from 2009 to 2017, plus the author of over 11 books and articles to numerous dimension. Newton and Martha have some things in common. They were both law clerks for Supreme Court justices, Fred M. Vincent for Newt, Thurgood Marshall for Martha. They have both received numerous honorary degrees from colleges and universities, and both are proponents of civil rights. By the way, Martha's student was Barack Obama, whom she recommended to her father for hiring at his law firm, which he did with pleasure. They have both served on numerous public service boards and our day would be lost in lists where I tried to name them all. They both share the view that a viable government, our democracy, depends on access to believable news delivery from the smallest local villages to the largest cities and states. Martha's book, Saving the News, Martha you will hold it up when she, when, she comes on the screen, makes the case since the nation's founding, since the nation's founding fathers, government has always been involved in regulating the news, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. She outlines this communication history with clarifying detail and probes the issues that weaken universal believable delivery of the news today. Best of all, she has 12 proposals which can help solve many of these issues to set us on the road to a news delivery system that will help the nation combat fake news, um, algorithm, algorithm bubbles, and help us unify our fractured nation. Newton, Martha, you're on with our thanks. Nancy, thank you. Um, 
let me begin by saying what a great honor it is for Martha and me to be participating in your wonderful series. And you have to say how sad we are with all our all family and friends across the country with the loss of your husband and the pride we have in your carrying on his work with the Stevenson Center. And Nancy, we count on you to carry on the principles and ideas that mean so much uh, to all of us. I want to just in, inject here. Thank you, Newt. That was lovely. And Ed would have loved enjoying this program with you and Martha and seeing all your girls who are here. So we miss it. Thank yeah. you, Nancy. Um, Martha um, has had this distinguished career, but I should emphasize that she grew up right here in <clears throat> Chicago, uh, went to the public schools in Cook County, and went to New Trier High School, uh, then on to the University of Michigan, and then to graduate school at Harvard, and then to Yale Law School. And her intellectual interests are so broad that she's written, I don't know, how many, how many books, Martha? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here. And I begin by asking her how she got involved in writing about the news. Well, thank you. And I first also want to say it is such a distinct honor to be here. And it's very meaningful, I think, for two minnows to be here with the Stevenson Center. Uh, I was so lucky to know Senator Stevenson and also Gov, as we called him. Uh, I actually wrote my undergraduate thesis about Adlai Stevenson uh, and his activities between the two runs for presidency. Uh, and a lot of my interest, Dad, as won't surprise you, uh, reflect the conversations that we had growing up around the dinner table. You and mom would come and ask me and my sisters, Nell and Mary, what we thought about the issues of the day, what we thought about the activities you were working on. Uh, and so from a very early age, we were in the discussions about politics and about law and about public service and about democracy. Uh, so that, of course, is the major reason I wrote this book. But there are two others. Uh, one is I'm, I'm very worried and I'm worried about democracy. Um, I've been worried particularly uh, since the 2016 election, but actually um, there are fundamental weaknesses in our system and the media and the destruction, the loss of reliable news, uh, the cacophony from the internet are a big part of the confusion and difficulties and the division. Um, and I guess there's just one more reason, which is um, I really admire journalists and see them, uh, those who aspire to be engaged in accountability and holding to accountability those in power in government and in private sector. I see them as a critical part of our way of life and our democracy. The fourth estate, they're often called, like the fourth branch of government. It's very striking to me as a constitutional scholar that there's only one private industry that's mentioned in the United States Constitution, and it is the press not just mentioned, but actually given a constitutional protection in the First Amendment of its own. And I think that reflects the understanding that not only the founders, but the first generation of Americans really had of the significance of sharing news, circulating it widely uh, to the project, really the extraordinary experiment of self-government. Very flawed at the beginning, a limited number of people allowed to vote though at the time it was the largest uh, percentage of a population ever allowing a vote. Um, but over time, it is a process that has expanded and expanded and the promise of democracy I still believe in, but
but I think it's in serious jeopardy. Martha, you're a teacher of constitutional law. And First Amendment, of course, apart from being the First Amendment of the Constitution, is really the heart of our system. But the First Amendment is, among most people today, is regarded as a restriction, uh, as a, a negative restriction on government. You don't quite see it that way, am I right? Well, we've had good conversations about this, Dad. The actual language in the First Amendment says Congress shall not make a law abridging the freedom of speech, dot, 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 or freedom of the press. Now, abridging is a uh, prohibition on limiting. Uh, over time, the courts have construed the clause to apply not only to Congress, but to the entire federal government and indeed state governments and local governments, any government. Um, but the l limitation is on uh, the governmental censorship, governmental uh, uh, suppression of speech. There is nothing in the Constitution that says the government cannot promote speech. And indeed, I think the Supreme Court and other courts have interpreted the First Amendment correctly to recognize a right of listeners, a right of readers, a right of people who want to have access uh, to what others are saying, not just to speak themselves. And, and what I do argue in this book is that there is uh, not only no barrier on the government's taking affirmative steps of that nature, there may even be an obligation for two basic reasons. One, the government itself has been deeply involved in shaping our media ecosystem. It didn't just crop up like Topsy. The government from the beginning funded the post office, which uh, also exempted the uh, uh, exchange of newspapers among each other from any postage and gave a reduced rate for the circulation of uh, information and news. And all the way through the telegraph where the government invested in it and uh, donated access to land, uh, and on into the development of broadcasting with which you have been so deeply involved, the allocation of the spectrum and setting conditions on who can have a license into the internet age where the government actually paid for the research that led to the internet. Uh, moreover, the government has been deeply involved in what we can call structural regulations, such as antitrust regulation, setting the terms of ownership um, and in shaping the industry, really the government's fingerprints are all over it. It's private, private industry, private return is a critical part of the American system, but it did not uh, happen without the government's shaping. And the second reason that I think there may be an affirmative duty on the government is that the commitment to create a Republican form of self-government it pervades the United States Constitution, and the Constitution is not a suicide pact. If we have reached a point where without government action, we will not be able to have self-government, and we will not be able to have reliable information to inform uh, citizens and voters, um, there are steps that public officials, including judges, can take to make sure that the enterprise continues. Now, Martha, just this week, <clears throat> a witness testified before the Senate and then the House who used to work for Facebook, uh, Frances Haugen, and she made some very important points, and inclu including some charges against what Facebook is doing. Can you give us your view of what she's about and what you think about what she's saying? Well, she is one actually of several uh, former Facebook employees who have started to speak out about their concerns, particularly about how the algorithms used by Facebook to sort and elevate and suppress uh, what people receive in their newsfeed and otherwise um, actually are dangerous and the dangers are known to the company and the company proceeds nonetheless. 
People are pointing that out uh, even before she spoke out about the Philippines and the relationship that Facebook has had with Duterte, the dictator, where Facebook created a special service for uh, his campaigns and, and his rulership and even helped to lay the hardware so that people in the Philippines would have access to Facebook, which is equated there to the internet. Francis Hagan, I think very courageously, uh, shared documents, not just her testimony in Congress, but she shared documents first with the Wall Street Journal uh, and others. Wall Street Journal has really conducted a major expose, talk about the power of journalism, uh, multi-part uh, coverage to identify such concerns as internal uh, documents at the company showing that the more uh, time that adolescent girls spend on Instagram, a, an entity bought by Facebook, uh, the more time they spend on the social media, the more they feel terrible about themselves and even contemplate suicide. This was known and there were proposals about how to change it. And the apparently uh, that was not uh, pursued, that kind of advice the almighty uh, guidepost for many of the social media companies is engagement, which is a nice way of describing addiction. Uh, the social media companies, the big ones, employ psychologists to try to exploit the vulnerabilities that all of us as human beings have about being able to turn away from what seems to be sensational or uh, outrage generating. Um, so I do think that Frances Hagen's uh, testimony and her willingness to, to really share documents and open up what had been a, a rather closed process inside of one major company uh, is providing an important public service. And one, one way, at least already, is that there's a kind of bipartisan uh, agreement that there's something wrong. And at a time of such division in this country, that, uh, that bipartisan recognition is itself a huge accomplishment. Do you anticipate that there will be some legislation that will result of, 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 of these things that are coming to, to the, uh, everybody's attention? I don't know. I, you know, the <coughs> last two years, we've already seen dozens of bills introduced into the Congress to modify I'm going to say something a little technical to modify the section of the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, which was created to offer immunity to what were then fledgling startup companies uh, making money using the internet platforms and shield them from competition so that they would not actually be liable for defamation or fraud or other civil uh, harms the same way, frankly, that the New York Times is liable or any other news outlet. Um, the proposals that have been in Congress for several years now have not secured agreement. Uh, there's a lot of agreement that there's a problem. There's not a lot of agreement about a solution. And I fear that may be true even in response to this recent uh, set of disclosures. Um, at the same time, you know, President Biden uh, has uh, appointed to head the Federal Trade Commission, someone who's been an outspoken critic of the big platforms. He's appointed to head the antitrust division of the Department of Justice, someone who's an outspoken critic, and he has advisors in the White House. Um, so there may be action, but finding the right way to act in, that does not produce government censorship is tricky. It is a challenge. Uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? I know you're optimistic. You're more <laughs> optimistic than I am, Dad. Um, I, I, I have hopes, but I am concerned. I think that uh, a lot of the reason that I wrote the book, you and I have been talking about this now for several years, is that there's a kind of decline even in the faith in the project of reason that characterized the internet, or I'm sorry, that characterized the enlightenment revolution. The enlightenment revolution really emerged from the terrors of wars in Europe where religiously based conflicts led to lots of people dying. 
And in that cauldron of terror, you know, people said, we can do better than this. They ended witch trials, they developed the scientific method, and they developed a set of ideals that really were the soil out of which the United States Constitution was grown. Those ideals put confidence in reason, confidence in critical thinking, absolute emphasis on toleration of differences, uh, and a belief that you can show what's false and then move on. Well, that's what's put in jeopardy right now. We see this with regard to COVID-related information about the vaccine, about the illness itself. Um, there's uh, just uh, so much noise, and it's very hard for people to actually know whom to trust. Over two-thirds of people in the world uh, now get some portion of their news from online sources. In the United States, it is a very high percentage, but that doesn't mean they're reliable. Uh, the good news and the bad news about the internet is that it eliminates the need for an intermediary, an editor, someone who's sorting and vetting what is reliable and what is not. It's good because it opens up citizen journalism and we can even have you know, people use their phones and take a, a video of a confrontation between police and someone who's uh, being attacked by the police. And that changes maybe uh, the criminal practices, the criminal uh, laws practices. Uh, we have um, uh, people who are able to offer their own eyewitness accounts of other events. But the negative is we have people making up stories. We have uh, teenagers in basements in the former Soviet Union countries trying to make money by selling uh, made up stories that will get eyeballs, that will draw ads and uh, conspiracy theories. We have foreign governments who are doing the same thing um, and finding the truth at this moment and using the old prescription of more speech, more speech will bring out the truth. There, that's, I think there, that's in jeopardy. It doesn't work anymore. We're gonna open this in a minute to uh, questions from um, our viewers. But I wanted to say that here at the Stevenson Center, where the Minow family has had the benefit of uh, friendships with Stevenson's over the generations, the Stevenson standard of politics, of principle, of good humor, of not being nasty to people you disagree with, is disappearing. Do you have any hope? Do you have any hope for the return to civility in politics and in public public affairs? Well, I am so lucky that I spend my days teaching talented young people from all over the world, and they are my source of hope. Um, they have many different viewpoints. They're from all different kinds of backgrounds. They don't agree about a lot of fundamental things, but they are eager, earnest. They do believe in reason and arguing and listening. And also many of them believe in public service. Um, so that is my source of hope. But I do have a question for you, dad, because you have seen all sides of the elephant of this communication world. Uh, what do you have more confidence in the private sector or government or nonprofits in improving uh, the access to reliable information? Well, I've always been an optimist about the future. I've been fortunate to live a long time. I'm approaching my 96th birthday. I've seen wars and I've seen depressions and I've seen assassinations. I've seen 9-11. Uh, I've seen terrible as well as good things. But I believe in our country. I believe in our system. And I believe that in the long run, uh, reason and civility will prevail. But at the moment, I get particularly discouraged about one thing, and that's what you mentioned. And that is, if we can't agree on what is a fact, if we argue about what is a fact, and if we're people who say there are alternative facts, then we're in trouble because we must agree on what is a fact and what isn't a fact. I remember uh, 
a friend, uh, Pat Moynihan, who later became a senator, he, he said it all in, in one sentence. He said, this is a free country and everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. And that's why your book, it seems to me, is so important that all of us get involved in doing something about it. Um, one last question, who, who do you see as the best minds who are dealing with the issues you're dealing with in your book? Well, I am lucky to be able to talk with people who have really immersed themselves in both the new technologies and the history of media, history of journalism. There are great scholars who've worked on this and then increasingly there are again, young people who are blogging about it and watching uh, the situation. I'm glad that we have the Columbia Journalism Review. I'm glad we have Fox. I'm glad we have people who uh, are at the Knight Center at uh, Columbia uh, and the Tau Center and uh, the Reuters Institute and Pew Charitable Trust, uh, people who are actually uh, supported by nonprofit funds. They're not uh, conflicted by serving uh, uh, the interests of a profit-making institution, and they're doing their best to tell the truth. I would just add this, and that is Martha's a trustee of the MacArthur Foundation, which is also dealing with these issues, right? That's true. And I do think that the nonprofit uh, sector has an important role to play. There are political scientists who study the rise and fall of democracies uh, tell us that an important ingredient in a democracy is the ability of individuals to organize political parties, to organize businesses, to organize nonprofits, and to create really this sector the both the private profit making and the nonprofit um, that help to enrich the society and create the conditions under which democracy can thrive. And I really do believe in that. Uh, Nancy, we like to turn it back to you and be happy to try to deal with questions if we can. Well, that was a wonderful conversation between the two of you. And I go back to my comments about Martha's book, one of the wonderful things about it for me was the history of the development of the technology and how that has put pressure on the old fashioned ways like the newspaper and, the, and those channels. So I do hope that people will read the book and I would love to have you talk a little bit more about what I could now call after reading your book, Algorithm Bubbles. Okay, well, thank you for that. Thanks for the kind words. There uh, are two ways in which our current moment um, it differs from prior eras. One is um, that more and more people, um, a majority of people in the United States get their news, be not because a human being made a decision, uh, an editor, to say this is worth people's attention, but because an algorithm did, it's just a mathematical formula that has the capacity to operate on large data sets. And the data sets that uh, the big uh, internet platforms use are the data of the prior viewing habits, the prior user habits of uh, those who are using their technology, but they do it focused on their ads, what ads they click on, uh, and the maximization of engagement uh, is their uh, primary interest. But it's not human beings making a decision. Here's a good story, or here's not a good story. Instead, it's based on, oh, this is rubbernecking. Here's something that gets people to pay attention and to forward it to someone else. It has nothing to do with the quality of the information. That's different. That, you go back to Ben Franklin, who had his own printing press. He made decisions about what people should read. And, you know, he wrote a lot of it himself, but, uh, and he wasn't bad. Uh, but that's really been the role of the intermediary, the editor. Uh, that's one way in which this age is very different. And another uh, that's related is the utter de destruction of the traditional news media. 
Uh, in the last uh, uh, 15 years, um, the, we have had the rise of what the Pew Charitable Trust is calling news deserts, areas in the United States where there is no local news, there's no local reporter whatsoever. Uh, that's so different. When Alexis de Tocqueville visited the United States in the 1840s, he was stunned to find how much interest and activity there was in reporting news in local areas. The United States at that time had more newspapers per capita than Canada, uh, than England. And uh, de Tocqueville said, even in uh, the, the woods, he'd go visit people in their huts and they were reading broadsides and newspapers and they knew what was going on and they thought it was of interest. We're living in a time now where half of the communities in America have either no local news or only one source. And one of the problems that emerges from that is real, uh, really well exemplified uh, by the, the what emerged when the Department of Justice studied why Michael Brown was shot by police in Ferguson, Missouri. And what emerged there was not only the demonstration that the criminal law system was, was funding itself on the backs of poor people and fees that were assigned uh, to the poorest people in the community, but there was no local news. There was no local television, there was no local newspaper, there's no local cable, there's nobody ex exposing that. Uh, and you know, another story that I just can't get out of my own mind is when lead was found in the water supply of Flint, Michigan. It's a horrible, horrible story. And I had the chance to meet with the public health doctor who was the whistleblower in that case. And she said to me, actually, Flint, Michigan was lucky. I said, what, what are you talking about? She says, we had really good local news. Uh, they amplified this, they investigated it. That led to changing the politicians in charge. It led to, to criminal action. She said, there are hundreds of Flint, Michigans around America, but there are no reporters telling us the story. So that's the second thing that's happening now that I'm very concerned about. Uh, and I have another question from the audience. Uh, this is from Jill Weinbanks. If government has a role in promoting speech, what happens when government is the source of lies? Well, uh, as Jill knows, as a very wise person about this, we are living in a time in this country and others where that is not just a hypothetical. That is a very real, real concern. You know, uh, Governments have their own abilities to speak, but it's why we have to have dispersed power and have the watchdog press and have nonprofit organizations and others. I am involved with the John F. Kennedy Library, which gives every year a Profiles in Courage Award. And I think uh, we could take a page from the Nobel Prize which this year gave the prize to two journalists who actually spoke out against leaders who make up stories, who lie and who are tyrannical, one in Russia and one in the Philippines. I think that the role of journalists right now deserves uh, recognition, but even more material support uh, because if they aren't able to uh, dig into the stories and get competing views, we're in trouble. And actually, we also, of course, need desperately people in public life who will call a lie a lie when it's coming from a political leader. Those are other people in politics, but they're also the heads of other institutions, uh, the private sector, uh, universities. And if we don't have that, and we don't right now, there's too much, I think, fear uh, out of uh, speaking out because we're living in a polarized time. But if we don't have that, we will have the worst form of the emperor's new clothes with something happening that everybody know isn't true, but people not being willing to speak about it. Here's another question uh, from Elizabeth Richter. Given the amount of disinformation on the internet, what strategies could be employed to convince those taken in by untrue content to realize what is true. Dad, do you have thoughts on that one? 
Well, <clears throat> this is makes me think, of course, about the fairness doctrine. The fairness doctrine existed in broadcasting since 1949 until it was stopped somewhere in the late 80s. And what it said was that a radio or television station should deal with controversial issues, but it should provide different views on those issues. Many broadcasters didn't like this. They thought it somehow interfered with free speech, when in fact, what it produced was more speech, not less speech. It simply produced different views on the issues. Eventually, this got to the United States Supreme Court, which upheld the constitutionality of the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, however, Congress, under a lot of pressure from outside interests, got rid of the Fairness Doctrine. It doesn't exist today. And that led to what many people criticize today as right-wing particular radio presenting extreme views without any balancing view. And that is what has led, of course, in cable to the no idea on the part of the cable operator that the cable operator must provide alternative views. Uh, this is where we are today, and this is where people very often look, take the issue right now of vaccines. Let, let's take that issue, where people are getting con controversial criticism that against vaccines, which is not based on any science, but there's no way we have figured out yet to, to deal with that fairly. Anyway, that's a long involved answer to a very difficult question. You know, Dad, you put uh, your finger on a very important uh, element of the misinformation, disinformation environment right now. A lot of it is not the internet. A lot of it is cable news, radio, uh, word of mouth. Uh, you know, more people watch Fox News uh, than all the other networks combined. Um, and so there once upon a time was an idea that journalists had a code of responsibility. Um, that's what we don't have right now. And we don't have the chance of building truth until there is some sense of responsibility on the part of people who are gatekeepers. There's an important book out right now by Jonathan Rauch called The Constitution of Knowledge. And he explores how science, how journalism, how academic uh, truths are uh, verified. And uh, through history, it's dependent on creating communities that actually set up standards for saying this is true and this is not true. And we're seeing a breakdown of that uh, right now. I do think that there are, you know, there's long-term and, and maybe there are a few short-term solutions. One is I, I do think I'm an educator, so of course I believe in education. I think that if uh, we really worked hard to make sure that every young person had very powerful experiences in making their own media and discovering the choices that are involved uh, and learning uh, about uh, manipulation and propaganda and exploitation of attention, we'd have more informed users. I also think that we should have regulation that requires uh, disclosures about how the algorithms are being manipulated. And I'd go further and say, people ought to have the ability to choose. Do I want my newsfeed uh, amplifying information based on what gets the most hits? Or do I want instead to select uh, my news feed based on uh, uh, a set of criteria uh, about reliable information. You know, it's interesting to me that you point to the fairness doctrine, uh, and while it is no longer the law, um, there are even people, undergraduates, trying to figure out, is it possible to make available news or opinions that are contrary to what people are otherwise receiving by algorithms? In a group of undergraduates at University of Chicago, in one semester, they created a, a program and they called it Flipside that does just that. 
It actually looks at the information they're receiving and use, does content analysis and through a way of coding it, identifies it in contrast with competing views. Now, one danger is that may just make everybody not believe anything. But one, recent research shows that people who actually read more, get more information online are more interested in politics. And I think that shows there's an appetite, there's a hunger to find out what might be true. Sometimes uh, our government screws up very badly. I'm going to give you one example. <clears throat> the broadcasters had a code of standards which they developed themselves. One of the standards was there should be no more than six minutes of commercials in, uh, in an hour of prime time. Six minutes was the ceiling. The government of the United States said, no, you can't do that because that's anti-competitive. And the government told the broadcasters, you cannot have a limit on commercial. Restraint of which trade. Is, which was insanity. Yeah. So sometimes common sense is missing in what we decide to do as a country. You know, one of the features of the United States is we are the most vigorous uh, on many fronts, including historically antitrust, absolutely historically about freedom of speech. But when we come to the internet, the United States is not the primary actor. And right now we are taking a back seat to other parts of the world. The European Union has been much more vigorous in regulating the internet. Uh, the UK, uh, Australia are also taking steps. And I, I really do believe ultimately there will have to be international action, uh, even a tr at the le level of a treaty or other kinds of cooperative work. Um, but uh, the failure of the US to take a leadership role is not the last word. If we don't act, we will be governed by others. That's a very powerful a comment for the for the ending. I do thank you so very much for participating. It's been a wonderful eye opener for me to read that book and then to follow up in the conversation with you both. And there's the book and uh, you can all enjoy it. Thank you, dear, dear Minnow family. I see Mary Minnow in the background and Nell is also there. Um, Martha, thank you. Newt, bless you. Such and an um, it was wonderful. Well, you honor us and we're very, we're very pleased, Nancy, that you're going to continue the fine work of the Stevenson Center. Well, we'll see what can go for the future. Thank All you right. for what you do. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.